Oh, am I recording already? Mm -hmm. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We're back. It's time for some more Mount Rushmore. So, get your popcorn ready. We're going to talk today about Seattle Mariners, San Diego Padres, swinging Friar Mariner Moose. Big on the mascot polls, by the way. They're like number like four and five for me. Because number one is Wally the Green Monster. Number two is the Philly Fanatic. Number three is probably... Hold on. I'm a big fan of the Blue Jays bird. He's pretty cool. Um, as well as Orbit from the Houston Astros. Big fan of him. But we'll get to the mascot Mount Rushmore at the end of these uh, lovely events. We're here today to talk about the Seattle Mariners and the San Diego Padres. So without any further ado, I'm going to try to fix this tablecloth. Let's go and do that. Take a swing of body armor. My wife just flipped me off. I love her too. We're going to start with the Seattle Mariners. The Seattle Mariners are uh, most known for their run in the 1990s. Their runs being losing in the second round of the playoffs. No World Series appearances. They do have the most wins in a single season. And that didn't end up well for them as they got bounced, I believe, in the Divisional Series that year. They didn't even make the ALCS. So what we're going to talk about the Seattle Mariners first. But first, like always, we go through our honorable mentions. First up, Randy Johnson, the big unit, uh, was a stable and a strong arm in that in that rotation for a really long time before he went to Arizona. Um, helped keep that pitching staff uh, together at times. So big fan of Randy Johnson, but I could not put him in my top four. And I'll explain why whenever we get there. Uh, second up is Alex Rodriguez. A-Rod was a prospect, a young, upcoming kid out of Miami. When the Seattle Mariners drafted him, and they turned into a stud for Miami, or first to be for Seattle. Uh, hit the ball all over the place. But his time in Seattle wasn't long enough for me to put him on this list. He was straight to Texas, and then New York, and then, yeah. So, A-Rod, honorable mention. Uh, after him, Jay Buter. Uh, Buter and, and guy who was going to be on this list, Ken Griffey Jr., were patriarchs and stability forces in that uh, Mariner outfield in the late uh, 90s. Uh, so, or excuse me, early, mid-90s, I guess, but 95-ish. 95-ish to 98-ish. Jay Buter and, and Griffey were really, like, the key guys there. So, big fan of Jay Buter. He is an honorable mention. Jamie Moyer, a guy who pitched for Seattle for a really long time. I left him off, but he was a really good piece for them. Um... And then, last but not least, Brett Boone. Brett Boone, I believe, was an MVP in Seattle, uh, but we left Booney off the list as well. So without any further ado, we get to the Seattle Mariners, Mount Rushmore. And coming in first is a guy you don't really need to introduce him. He is the, well, in my mind, the second greatest center fielder of all time and one of the guys who kept baseball relevant in Seattle and really was a staple for most kids my age. He is the inventor of the backwards hat. It is Ken Griffey Jr. This one was the easiest one that you could do, so let's start with Griffey. Griffey in his time in Seattle, which was 13 seasons. He started in Seattle, went to Cincinnati, had a season in Chicago before returning to Seattle for his last two seasons. So Griffey's 13-year career as a member of the Mariners, he played in 1,685 games. He had 1,843 hits, 1,113 runs scored. He had 341 doubles, 30 triples, and 417 home runs. As a member of the Mariners, he had a 292 batting average and a 374 on base percentage. Griffey was his, I guess, really as easy as it came to be on this list. There's no other guy that, whenever you talk about to a Seattle fan or really anyone that knows the game of baseball, the guy who saved Seattle baseball was Ken Griffey Jr. Jr. got them Safeco Field. Yes, he wasn't there whenever it opened, but I was fortunate enough to be in Seattle in 2007 when Ken Griffey Jr. made his return as a member of the Cincinnati Reds. His first game there was the first game of my round the, the United States tour uh, of going to different stadiums. And the reaction that Griffey got inside that, or inside that stadium was mind-blowing. It was loud, it was raucous, he got a 45-minute standing ovation. And it's probably the most packed I've ever seen of visiting teams batting practice. Uh, and Griffey didn't uh, didn't deny. He put on a show during batting practice, and it was great to see Griffey's return to Seattle. Because I believe the only reason why they're still in Seattle is because of Ken Griffey Jr. Junior's time in Seattle, he was a 10-time All-Star. 
He won the MVP. He finished in the top five four other times. Had ten gold gloves and seven silver sluggers. Griffey was really the guy who invented robbing the home run. Griffey was the guy who invented the backwards hat. Put on a show at Boston's All-Star Game in 1999. So it was really easy for me to put Griffey on this list. The Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. You, you can't think about Seattle baseball without Griffey. Speaking of Hall of Famers, we're going to transition to the number two guy on our list. He is the second greatest designated hitter of all time in my mind. It is Edgar Martinez. Edgar Martinez revolutionized the DH position and probably would have been the number one guy if there had not been a guy, I don't know, by the name of David Ortiz. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's pretty good. Might be on the Boston Mount Rushmore. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. Uh, but in Edgar's 18-year career, all of which was in Seattle, uh, he played 2,055 games. He had 2,247 career hits, 1,219 runs scored, 541 doubles, 15 triples, 309 home runs as a Mariner, had a 312 batting average, and a 418 on base percentage. He was a seven-time All-Star and a five-time Silver Slugger Award winner. Edgar, like I said, is a guy that could hit for days. Um, they had to find a way to get him in the lineup every day, and the way they did it was the designated hitter spot. And that really became the niche that Edgar dug in and really made the American League revolutionize the, Amer the, the designated hitter. Uh, so when I look at the DHs, the greatest DHs of all time, Ortiz, Edgar Martinez, and then a guy by the name of Harold Baines. Um, I know he didn't play DH for a long time, but his time in uh, Baltimore where he was the DH was really, really good. Um, so, Edgar, Griffey, both Hall of Fame members, both on the Seattle Mariners, Mount Rushmore, and the next guy I'm going to talk about is a guy that I think is inevitably going to join Ken Griffey Jr. and Edgar Martinez in Cooperstown. It is the gun from the rising sun. It is Ichiro. Ichiro, in 14 seasons as a member of the Seattle Mariners, he started in Seattle, went to New York, had a stop in Miami, finished with Seattle. Played in a couple games actually this year in Japan, but Ichiro is my latest member of the Seattle Mariners, Mount Rushmore. In 1,861 games played in Seattle uniform over 14 seasons, he had 2,542 hits, 1,181 runs scored, 295 doubles, 79 triples, and 99 career home runs as a member of the Mariners. He hit 321, he had a 385 on base percentage, and stole over 430 bags as a member of the Mariners. He's a 10-time All-Star, an MVP, a Rookie of the Year, 10-time 10, 10 Golden Glove winner, and a 3-time Silver Slugger. Ichiro really... Once Griffey was gone, once A-Rod was gone, once, you know, the guys that built this team were gone, Seattle really went through a lull, and they were able to get Ichiro to sign there, and he actually helped save baseball again in Seattle. He was part of the 116-win team. That team was really, really good. Should have probably played in the World Series, but unfortunately were unable to get there. Uh, Ichiro was the godson of the Japanese, uh, and he... Took well to the American culture, uh, was a big piece uh, for Seattle, and I loved Ichiro. I, I went whenever he was here in Miami. I saw him all the time. Great, great, great player. I was fortunate enough to see him play multiple times in person, and that's something that I'll always remember. And I inevitably think that Ichiro will join the two other guys in Ken Griffey Jr. and Edgar Martinez in Cooperstown shortly. Last but not least in the Seattle Mariners, Mount Rushmore, an active player. Uh, I am putting King Felix, Felix Hernandez, in there. In 15 seasons as a member of the Seattle Mariners, 169 and 132, he has a 3.38 ERA and 411 starts. He has 25 complete games, 11 shutouts. He's thrown 2,696 and two-thirds innings pitched. As a member of the Mariners, he has 2,501 strikeouts, and he has a 1.201 whip. He is a six-time All-Star. He's won the Cy Young and finished in the top five three other times. King Felix deserves to be here for the simple reason of I think he's been by far better than Jamie Moyer and Randy Johnson on the pitching front. He's on it all in Seattle. Um, he is going to be free agent at the end of the year, so I'm kind of interested to see what Felix does. Hopefully, Seattle does him right, gives him one or two-year contract, and let him go out with the team that he's been with his entire career. I, I, like th I think Felix will stay there if they at least offer him something. Um, so I put Felix here just based off of the fact of 2,600 innings, 2,500 strikeouts. Uh, he's made 411 starts as a member of the Mariners. He's been there through the good. He's been there through the bad. Hurt. Uh, he was relatively healthy for the bulk part of his career. The last couple of years he's been dinged up due to injuries. So that's kind of been a sad, sad uh, decline rapidly for a guy. 
But he threw a lot of innings whenever he was healthy. So I think the Seattle really got the build that they needed out of Felix. They were just unable to finish it off. So that is the Seattle Mariners Mount Rushmore. It is Felix Hernandez, Ichiro Suzuki, Edgar Martinez, and Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, if you disagree with me or you think someone else deserves to be there, Brett Boone, A-Rod, Randy Johnson, Jamie Moyer, uh, insert name here, whoever you think it is, feel free to put it in the comments. I'll debate with you a little bit on why I think you're right or wrong, why you may have changed my mind, and maybe I'll have to come down here and do a different episode of the Seattle Mariners if you guys can uh, persuade me enough with your knowledge of the Seattle Mariners organization. So, we'll now transition to another team on the West Coast in the NL West. All right, this team representing the NL West today is in the southern part of California. It is the San Diego Padres. That change, our four. So, take Mariners hat off. This one's a little tight. I might have to get rid of this one. I'm going to go down my list um, of hats that are going to be for sale. Hats worn by me on this show may go on sale. We'll, you guys, we'll keep you guys updated on that. But we'll talk about the San Diego Padres first. The honorable mentions Adrian Gonzalez, who was a key part of their offenses in the 2000s before being moved to the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Andy Ashby, a starting pitcher from the early runs of the decent Padre teams, I guess, is the best way to say that. Uh, a guy who spent his entire career, or I guess 90% of his career in San Diego, Phil Nevin, and a guy who probably is most known for being a steroid user, but I still think he should have been on this list, is Ken Caminetti. Uh, the Padres were a team that I struggled to get four guys to put on the Mount Rushmore. Maybe that's because I don't know a ton about the San Diego Padres, but the first two were the easiest two. We'll start with them. Uh, First up, the second greatest closer of all time, Trevor Hoffman. Hoffman spent 16 seasons in San Diego, not his entire career. Uh, he did have a stop, I know for sure, in Milwaukee and I think one other. Oh, he started in, in, uh, as a member of the Marlins before he was traded to the Padres. Uh, Hoffman's career record as a member of the Padres, 54-64, and 64, with a 2.76 ERA and 902 appearances. He had 552 saves as a member of the Padres, 952 and a third innings pitched. 1,029 strikeouts and a 1.04 whip. Um, I say it's the same greatest closer of all time, and I absolutely mean that. The only closer better than him ever it will, is Mariano Rivera. Um, Hoffman broke the all-time save records first, then Mo caught Hoffman. Um, so Hoffman w did stand alone for a little while there, but we all knew it was on borrowed time before Mariano got him. Hoffman is a six-time All-Star, finished second twice in Cy Young Awards. Um, closers don't really normally win Cy Young Awards, uh, they really don't really have their own award. I mean, they, there's like this reliever of the year thing, but it's not really noted by any of the main sources. Because um, if so, Hoffman would have won the National League probably 13 out of those 16 years. Um, Hoffman is a really, really, really good pitcher. Um, but I think uh, he was the second easiest choice on this. He is a member of the, the Baseball Hall of Fame. He is joined by fellow Hall of Famer Tony Wynn. Mr. Padre, 20 seasons, all of them in a Padre uniform. He played in 2,440 games, had 3,143 hits, had 1,383 runs scored, had 542 career doubles, 85 career triples, 135 home runs. He had 319 stolen bases. He had a 338 batting average and a 388 on base percentage. He was a 15-time All-Star, a 7-time Silver Slugger, and a 5-time Gold Glove Award winner. Mr. Padre, um, probably one of the greatest hitters of all time. Um, a guy who never tried to do too much, and a guy who always did his job. Unfortunately, we lost Tony uh, to cancer. Um, he was a member of the San Diego State coaching staff. Um, they erected a statue in his honor in San Diego. Uh, San Diego is actually one of the stadiums that I've not been to um, in my ballpark soiree. Um, and I hope to cross it off the list fairly soon. So I'd like to see that statue. I'd like to see, um, you know, the new stadium in San Diego because uh, you always feel Tony when you think about the San Diego Padres. Um, it's a shame that he's not there. It's a shame that he's not there to throw out the first pitches at, at you know, throwback days and stuff like that. Um, but Tony was a really, really, really great player, and he was uh, always did his job. He was never one of those guys that had to be flashy, um, and I think that's why his numbers look the way they do. 
135 career home runs, but he hit 338. There aren't many guys that are going to end up with a career batting average of 338. Um, so you always tip your cap to Tony on that. Like I said, it's unfortunate that he's no longer with us. He is a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. The next two guys are guys that I just... For some reason, when I looked at the stats of, of the guys that I mentioned, the honorable mentions, these two guys just, I felt their duration as Padres, they, they fit this a little bit better. Um, first off is Dave Winfield. Winfield played eight seasons in San Diego, played in 1,117 games, had 1,134 hits, had 599 runs scored, had 179 doubles, 154 home runs, 620, 626 RBIs. That's a shout-out to Jager right there, 626. Uh, he had a 284 batting average as a member of the Padres and a 357 on base percentage. He was a four-time All-Star and a two-time Gold Glove Award winner. I just feel like his numbers stacked up better um, for when he was playing than Adrian Gonzalez and Phil Nevin and Ken Caminetti's in their time. Um, looking at other guys that succeeded um, in comparison uh, to those guys in their eras, I felt Winfield's numbers stacked up more with the guys that he was playing with in that, in that time frame. Um, so Winfield was a hard choice. He probably was the fourth guy on my list. He was probably the last one in. He was really battling with Adrian Gonzalez and Phil Nevin. Um, cause you know, I like to give shout outs to guys that stay there for most or all of their career. And Nevin was a guy that was in San Diego for a really, really long time. Last but not least, a guy who had to leave San Diego to finally get a World Series ring, which is unfortunate. It's Jake Peavy. Peavy pitched eight seasons in San Diego. Was 92 and 68 with a 3.29 ERA. Had 212 starts, seven complete games. Pitched 1,342 and two thirds innings pitched in Padre uniforms. Had a had a thousand and one thousand three hundred and forty eight strikeouts. If I could talk today, that'd be great. Uh, and a 1.18 WHIP for the starter. Um, like I said, spent eight years in San Diego. He was a two time All Star and won a Cy Young Award. Um, I don't know if there's enough good things that you can say about um, Jake Peavy in a Padres uniform. Um, he was a guy that pitched with some really bad teams around him and always kept those guys in it, was a bulldog, always fought, always you know went out there and wanted the ball every fifth day. And that's something you don't see a lot in baseball anymore. So Peavy was that warrior um, and that transition whenever he went to Boston. Um, you know, I got to see it as a Red Sox fan, and I, and I respected the hell out of it. But I know that PV did that as well in San Diego, and I think that was a, a really, you know, tip of your cap thing to him there. Um, inevitably, I think he may end up in the Padres Hall of Fame. I don't know if PV's numbers are good enough for his career to get to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, that's just one of those where I don't know if, I don't know if the argument can be made there. Um, so my Padres Hall of Fame, Tony Wynn, Trevor Hoffman, Jake Peavy, and Dave Winfield. So that concludes these two West Coast teams. I've, I've stayed on the, the coasts with, with what I'm doing. So we're going to stay there. We're going to go a little bit further north in San Diego. We're going to go to the San Francisco, Oakland, Sacramento area. We're going to talk about the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's next Uh so, if you agree or disagree with my Padres and my Mariners about Rush Wars, feel free to leave a comment and tell me what I did right, what you agree with, what you don't disagree with. Tell me why you think Andy Ashby or Adrian Gonzalez or somebody like that deserves to be in over Dave Winfield and or um, Jake Peavy. So, Giants A's up next for the Mount Rush Wars. But what's next for me is a little different. You guys know I'm a big wrestling fan. AEW is going to have All Out coming out. Uh, so, I'm going to do a preview show Plus some unfortunate news that came out of there. Uh, John Moxley out of all out with a elbow infection. MRSA. Uh, Kenny Omega gets a new opponent. It is the bastard Pac, formerly Neville of WWE. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. We'll talk about NXT going up against AEW once the TV stuff starts. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to thank my producer Carol, who's back there doing something. Uh, she's going to edit this thing. We're going to get it up. Uh, follow me on Instagram at Fat Kid Certified SE. Uh, give me a subscribe, a like on this one, a dislike, tell me what I did wrong, tell me if the camera messed up because halfway through this the camera died so we had to come back and scrap the original back half of the Padres. So we're going to get some more chargers, we're going to get some more cameras, we're going to get this thing up and running but we need your guys' help. So feel free to like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at they call me Burn. all the fun stuff, a lot of good stuff coming up. Wrestling retrospective with myself, Ernest, and Joe. We'll be back recording this week. Uh, we were unable to last week due to some scheduling stuff. So, again, as always, thank you for following along. 
Jays, excuse me, Giants A's next on Mount Rushmore. AEW hype video coming up soon. Until then, fat kid out.